All right, so look, you know, um, this is probably a bittersweet moment for all of you watching. A lot of you have actually been coming up to me in the street saying, oh my God, I can't believe the podcast is going away. It was almost like, you know, uh, you got bad STD results. But look, it is what it is. Oh my God. <laughs> We've all been there. No. Uh, this is, uh, you've had an STD. You ever had an STD? Never. Okay, well, let me do the intro. Um, <laughs> this is Hollywood Unlocked Uncensored with Jason Lee and uh, Damage and Bluey here. And this is the final episode. You know, we've um, been doing this show for about six years. Six years now this show's been going on. I always joke and say it's the Destiny Child of Podcast because, you know, it's as the seat turns. Um, but but, but <laughs> it's, it's so crazy that the show is ending now. It's not crazy, but it's unfortunate that the show is ending now because this is like when I've enjoyed the show the most. I feel like with both of you, we've had diversity. We have a real straight guy on the show. Um, you know, we have somebody that's actually really smart um, and doesn't play it. But, you know, we all have, we all bring our own different things to the table. <laughs> and we actually like each other. And that, yeah. that, I think, is the most amazing thing. And um, when I was doing press and talking about the show before and then, like, thinking about kind of how I wanted to evolve as a brand outside of Hollywood a lot, because really this ending of the show is not about this not working mm -hmm. because we're going to work together at some point again. It was more about, like, how does Jason Lee evolve past Hollywood Unlocked? How does Jason Lee build his own brand and continue to evolve in the space of talk um, and just all the different opportunities that have been coming? And then, and then also, um, I feel like we've done everything we can do with the show. I just feel like we weren't growing. The show wasn't going to grow anymore because we've done it. Yes, we've kind of done a live tour. Live tour. Uh, yes, we can, uh, yeah, we, we can still do a live tour. <laughs> live tour. <laughs> yeah, live tour. coming soon at some I point. Mean, it might be the fair world tour. But we can, <laughs> you know, I don't know. The I last just, dance. I don't know. I just felt like just the evolution of Jason Lee and where this I was at um, was just, I needed to do something new. Um, and so, yeah, I decided that this was it. But um, I think the hardest part was, you know, ending this. And Damage called the other day. And, uh, you know, I see DJ Damage. I'm like, because oh, he don't really call me. Hello? And he's like, <laughs> Well, I just want to say, I'm like, oh, sh this is going to be emotional. What's up? <laughs> but no, I just want to thank both of you before we get into it, just with um, your commitment, your loyalty, um, you know, your drive, and especially like you coming in at a time where the sh was literally turbulent. Um, mm, you heard. jumped in and you held it down, and I didn't know where the show was going to go, and so I just appreciate and thank both of you. For I do have to say this to take the, the Beyonce Destiny's Child analogy. When Destiny's Child broke up, <laughs> I was convinced that Kelly and Michelle had to be upset. Like, you have to be mad until this happened. And I realized I'm not upset. Damage wasn't upset. We were so happy for you. Like, none of us was like, oh, damn, Jason. You know what I mean? So it's one of those things of when you really do care about someone and something makes sense for them, it doesn't feel like an ending. It just feels like a beginning. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. So I know you had a moment where I could tell you were carrying some guilt. Like, how do I tell them? Look at them. Because we went to lunch and we were looking into your faces. Like, <laughs> two, like, he, like hey, Jason. You don't want to say it's over. And then we, went, we left lunch and said, I think he was going to tell us he's ending the show. And he looked into our beautiful faces and chickened out. So we knew that it was time and that you just loved us so much you couldn't say it. Well, even on Easter, I was like, oh, just eat the, just eat the food, anime. You know, because, yeah, I mean. First of all, I don't like saying goodbye, and this really isn't goodbye. And, and it, it's funny when we say the Destiny's Child analogy because um, I could see that moment being, I, for years I was like, Beyonce don't care about Kelly and Michelle. Mm -hmm. But you know, you really do. It's just, I, there's so many moving parts of what's happening in my life right now. And I just was, I became, I was suffering from, um, what do you call it, burnout. Because mm -hmm. I hadn't had a break. Um, I'm going on all cylinders all the time. Uh, and then I felt like I hadn't really enjoyed the process. Like we had a nationally syndicated radio show, which I don't know, you know, if all of y'all remember that, but we were nationally syndicated. We started in 52 markets. We grew to 72 markets. It wasn't the best deal, but we did it to prove our concept. We did it and we thought that that proof would turn into something else with iHeart and it didn't. And we decided to leave, but you know, we, we did that. You know, we did our tour, went to all the cities, we went to your hometown. Mm -hmm. um, we were able to um, do things that I think other self-made brands weren't able to do. We yep. had a show on Fox Soul um, and that had a good run. Um, and we did whatever we wanted to do, you know? And I think just the level of freedom and the example of what we built was amazing. I just feel like I had the burnout and I had to call Charlemagne because I was like, yo, I'm experiencing something I've never experienced. I've never felt depressed and uninspired. And um, just like, I felt like it was really consuming me. And yeah. I checked in and figured I hadn't had a break for a while. So I'm like, yo, I want to take a couple months 
to just breathe and not have the demand of booking a show or showing up and filming or I didn't even get dressed today. I just threw on whatever was in my closet that it wasn't too wrinkled. Does that happened to Balenciaga? <laughs> okay, honey. I, got it. I don't know. I didn't have anything to wear, so I just threw on this no, two-piece listen, Balenciaga these outfit. These pajama-looking clothes, they're, they're, they're very comfortable. No, I just I felt burnout, and it was kind of scary because there were days I was asking myself, like, am I, do I still want you want to do this anymore? I sent you a meme. The meme was a list of all the things of burnout, and Jason was every single thing on the meme. It really was. You were everything on that list, so yeah. And the thing about burnout, too, is when people love you, they care that you're burning out and they want you to get better. When people are using you, they want you to do whatever you need to do to keep going. So I think part of this is we actually care about you, and the burnt out Jason keeping the show on for another season wouldn't make us feel good, you know what I mean? So I think the audience needs to recognize that it's rare but there are times in this city where you can actually meet people who actually want you to win too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's just time for evolution. I know when I first joined the show, I knew how the show was looked at from the outside looking in where it's like, it's just this ratchet show and they yeah. do a bunch of crazy things. And it was a little bit like that, right? And then we seen a moment where- <laughs> yeah, I thought it was yeah. no, no. You was- missed the episode where I called damage and I said, we booking somebody who's gonna come in and play with some deal with those damage. He's like, absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> Jason got mad at me too. He was pissed. I'm like, bro, oh, I don't have to be at that episode. I don't have to be there. Now we had a whole meeting about, so you got an issue coming to a show where they got some dildos? He's like, listen, I'm not going to be on a show with a man playing with dildos. With a bunch of dicks in front of like, me. Like, what? <laughs> to see why I had but, to be but, there. You know, it really set the course for, like, understanding the platform and the reach and, like, the obligation to evolve a little past dildos. Like, you know? <laughs> but, I think we did a good job. No, but it was, a, it was a moment where everything happened during the protest during COVID where our show quickly turned into an outlet for people to get their voices heard and for us to address some really serious conversations and it showed how important it is to have black owned media outlets because Mm -hmm. we didn't have anyone controlling our narrative. And so, so quick it's like, oh, this is this kind of show. But in the moments where black people needed us, we were there front and center interviews every week that matter, having real detailed conversations that we didn't have to worry about being edited or being taken a certain way because it was coming from the people it affected. So I feel like this show was so powerful on so many different levels. Mm -hmm. It was entertaining but also very insightful and also helped a lot of people during that time. Yeah, no, it did. I also think as a woman, too, it was interesting coming into this space with two men and how open you guys were to learn about things from a woman's perspective. Um, because I feel like there's, there's different kinds of women in this industry. There are those who just want to look cute and like be liked, and there are those who want to educate and elevate, right? <laughs> and I would like to think Wait, that I'm the latter group. Where are you group. going with that? <laughs> I know I'm saying I'm the latter group. I want to educate and elevate. And part of elevation is, what does Farrell always say? The truth will set you free, but first it'll piss you off. Mm-hmm. And I love that people watched us work through hot topics and evolve and grow to, uh, with each other on those topics, mm-hmm. which is why, Jason, I even sent you a message. When I see you in other shows and you're educating women on how to be less misogynistic, <laughs> I'm like, is that J- Jason Lee? Is that you? Like, what? Are you so, talking about the Angela Lee episode? I was so proud of you. I started, I literally started clapping. I love people seeing that men and women can talk through topics together and identify their own blind spots and like work through like a common happy ground because gender wars are so big right now. I think there's not enough of that. So I love our conversation. But I'll give you credit for helping me with that too because when we started the show, you know, we have cameras, and we have the lights, and we have the little microphones. We ain't thinking there's people watching. I right. actually used to get surprised when people were like, y'all can't believe you said that. I'm like, I can't believe I said it either. But you know, I, you, you know, in our conversations and just you being on the show, you know, you've reminded me of the obligation of using this platform to really make sense of what we're doing, right? Yeah. And I think, like, I didn't really understand the disconnect between me and women with the show when I was saying all the things I was saying because <laughs> I, I was just saying shit. I had no idea. I was just saying, like, why are they mad? You know, well, you know, why are they mad? But then when I started realizing like 70% of the people who show up for me are women. Most mm-hmm. of them are black women. You know, people who buy advertising in my businesses are small black businesses and black brands and black artists. And when I think about, you know, the, the impact and the, the amount of people that we're reaching on a daily basis. You know, yesterday we posted a video and I saw like 65,000 or something views in like 10 minutes. That's 65,000 people or 65,000 views of a video that we posted. So Mm -hmm. if we're going to get into 65,000 minds, what are we actually doing? What are we saying? And in a world where people are pulling up to grocery stores and killing everybody black, we have a a responsibility. And so when I'm in spaces now and I hear something, I'm like, "Mm, my audience, even though it's not my house, I need to represent my audience wherever I'm at. 
That's beautiful. And, you know, sometimes I'm ratchet too because Drink Champs <laughs> was a good. I, I that was that was a that was a good uh, show for me because I was able to get off what I felt that day and but still stay on brand. You know, duality is a thing, and I think a lot of people find found it harder to pigeonhole you when they saw you showing up for those conversations in that way. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people, can, they can pigeonhole all three of us as the straight dad and then, you know, the pansexual, like, newsy one and Jason Lee doing the razzle-dazzle. But, like, a lot of times when we talk, we have more in common than we have dissimilar. Mm -hmm. And I think the audience needs to see that more. There's a healing in that that they don't really re recognize is happening in the middle of all the entertainment that's happening. No, I think it's an important dynamic because also when I first started, I know how people were very afraid that you're going to be on a show with Jason <laughs> Lee. You know he's... You know he's gay, right? And I'm like, so. And but yeah. that's how I felt, and yeah. I feel like doing this show for so many people to help them understand that it doesn't matter. And it's yeah. so crazy that at this point in time, you still have to have these conversations. Like, you know, that doesn't matter, right? What this person does has nothing to do with you. And it's been so many people have actually reached out to me in private, trying to ask questions on how to navigate certain spaces and environments. Where I'm like, just do you and let them do them but I don't understand, I don't want to come off as, I'm like, well, you're not, right? Mm -hmm. So why does it matter so much? So I feel like this dynamic was so impactful on a different level because I haven't seen a dynamic like this on any media I've platform. Never... I also said, well, you know, you're the first time, you're the first straight guy we've had host the show. Um, <laughs> Wait a minute. And, and I think that, I th think that, um, I mean, allegedly. Allegedly. Um, I think that it's so crazy because, yeah, my sexuality has never been an issue among the group. and. Yeah you know, being able to share a space where we have wild conversations. Some of the funniest <laughs> moments is Damage's reaction when I say some crazy yeah. shit. And I'm like, I'm like what is this? And stuff? it's genuine, like, dumb fun, like, what just I'm happened? Like, I just crossed the line, but we just gonna keep on rolling. You know, but, you know, I think it's that, but, but see, I think, again, understand our impact. When you show up in spaces like that and you can coexist, right, um, it shows inclusion is important. It shows that we all are not a monolith like we're different types of people we can coexist mm -hmm. we can share experiences and conversations that doesn't make us teeter on what our position is in life you know you and i think it's it's um it's it's the extreme confidence in who you are as a man and i think that you know when you look at what's happening in the world with people being uncomfortable with mm -hmm. gay people or gay conversations or trans this or that you know just existing just be like if they're not disrespecting your personal space or mm -hmm. your personal position on things it's okay to let them live out their best gay life. And, I, and on this show, I've been gay. It, it costs you nothing to honor somebody's truth. And also, people didn't know what pansexual was. So I came on the show. I got so, a pan who now? So I feel like I have to do a lot of education around that. But I just feel like as black people, we need to be united more than divided. So if we find little bits and pieces, pieces to be separated, it's just silly anyway, because we need yeah. each other. So it doesn't matter what you do in your personal time or what you talk about, because it has nothing to do with me. And I feel like we have to normalize that more and I feel like this show is a great platform to show that we can all sit down, different points of views, different walks of life, and you can still see all the common traits that we have. Like Common traits, but also not, because black folks do have a tendency to tolerate you rather than accept you, right? No, that's true, And too. so one thing I will say <laughs> that we do is we don't just tolerate each other. We actually accept and even celebrate each other. And that's different because, Jason, the way you got us was, this wasn't something like we went on Craigslist or we went on American Idol, like a boy <laughs> band. We actually had chemistry with you as human beings, no, 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 completely hired, separate no, from I the show. I hired you because Melissa didn't like you. I mean, that's, 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 that's not why you hired me. The I mean, story, let the streets tell it. No, the, way, the funny thing is, Jason, I had lived in a five- a And five, I hired you because the Geo Army just hated you so much. He's trolling y'all one last time. And the funny thing is, I remember Jason showed up to my house. I was on the fifth floor. There was an elevator, but for some reason, my PA at the day didn't tell Jason there was an elevator. And my ass was 323 pounds. So him and, and Ariella walked up, walked up three flights of stairs. Yeah. And you gave me talk a list. commitment. You, I was shocked. And you came and gave me a list of things that we were not going to talk about that I was going to respect. And we were doing humanizing. We were only on episode like five, right? We didn't know the pandemic was going to happen three days later. Yeah. So Jason was it said, three days after that? Literally, you were the last person I interviewed before the pandemic. Oh, wow. And so we sit down on the couch and I'm thinking, I have 45 minutes with Jason Lee. I have to make it work. I have a list that I'm not going to touch. Let's go. We were there for four hours kicking. Wait, did I send you a list of what I didn't want to talk about? And we talked about everything on the list. I had yeah. to stop you like, Jason, that's on your list. You're like, I'm having fun. F it, let's go. And it was four hours of us just talking as people. But that was one of the first interviews I did where somebody was interviewing me. Like, it was yeah. weird. Like, what the f you, what you want to talk to me about? But that's when I came out with my book, God Must Have Forgotten About Me. It was and a good it book, was, and that, But that was the moment I knew. I was like, yo, she's f talented. Um, and I didn't know, of course, that, you know, my 
situation was going to unfold the way that it did or whatever. But that's why when, when I had that opening, you know, I, I listened to the audience. The audience wanted somebody who was genuinely smart, um, genuinely re represented them um, that, that, you know, you know, we're in Hollywood and sometimes we feel like, you know, we have to have a reporter or have, a, you know, a model or have an influencer or have somebody with a million followers. It's like, no, you got to have somebody that can roll up their sleeves and get in the dirt, but also come with class and, and intelligence. And I feel like you fit that. The Humanized interview is one of my favorite. I wish more, more of you would watch it because it was the first time I felt like somebody saw me more than just, I think you called me a tree. <laughs> Y'all can you watch said, it now. You said you wanted, you wanted um, so. people to think to know that I wasn't just a, an emotionless tree or something like that. Because I really feel like people thought that he's just so wild and crazy and don't care. You were so but kind I think, that day, though. You but I think that's all. the crazy part about me meeting you because I didn't meet you off the show. I didn't see you on the show for I met you in person. Like, we would go and get hookah all the just time. Just hanging out. And yeah. just talk. So when I did see you on the show, I was like, oh, they don't know. Like, of course it's you. I'm not going to act like that's not you, but it's like... Hookah Jason's different. <laughs> Jason is different. Yeah. It's not like there's two different... Yeah. 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 It's not, and people have to understand that about all of us. Like, yeah. there's going to be a certain point where we're going to entertain and have a good time. It's like jokes. When you're with your friends, you're going to talk, but this is not... I just I try to tell this to people all the time, like who you see as Jace is not just one person. You're not just one person. I always say there's a persona, right? Like I always say that there's the DJ damage that everybody expects. <laughs> and then there's that dude that I talk to, like, this is not DJ damage, it's a it's a regular person. There's the Jason Lee that everybody sees. But when I talk to you, I always see the boy in the book. Because he and I had a similar childhood, and I was like, mm. Jason, I see you as a person. Mm. And even down to us both liking chocolate milk and when we're stressed as kids, like, I saw you as a person, and when you called and said, do you want to be on the Wait. show, I made it a point to say, I like chocolate milk. see, we all like chocolate milk, we should really be the chocolate milk game. I even said to you, I was like, Jason, I'm only doing the show because I like you. Because I know it's supposed to be a look, mm -hmm. but if I hadn't liked you that day, I would have said no, because it actually felt good to be talk to yeah. you. So I think folks need to recognize that real chemistry, you can't fake that. I, like I think it goes deeper like too. I think milk. I think when you think about black people in general, we're not the sum of one experience. You yeah. know what I mean? And and I, I won't lie. You know, <laughs> this show also started becoming like very Oprah esque. And Oprah, we love you somewhat. You know what I mean? Like you've been a great contribution to the world of media. But like, no, I I I want to turn it up a little bit. You know, yeah. I like I, I like that energy. But I also like having a voice. And I feel like sometimes the antics. Uh, distracted people from the messages. Yeah, and, you know there were a lot of times where like things happened. I was like, "See, I told you. See, I told you." Funny story. This literally just happened. I got to say this. Um, so I was in Miami a couple weeks ago, I think. Yeah, a couple weeks. And uh, so I'm in the club. I had been drinking. I had been hanging out. I was outside like all day. So I go to live and I see my jeweler. I'm like, "Yo, I'm about to go holler at my jeweler real quick." So I walk over and he's like, "Get up here." So I stand up on the table. I'm, I'm talking to him. We're, you know, live is going crazy. And I look down. And LeBron James is standing at the table. It's LeBron's table, right? Oh, wow. So there's been this long-standing thing where, you know, Tristan Thompson was on the team with LeBron. And mm -hmm. LeBron mm. has wanted to stay away from me. You know, like, keep him away from me or whatever. And so I heard that he, you know, was a little uncomfortable with me or whatever. Uh, so I see his friend who's on the show. Mind you, I want to be on the show. The sh I think it's called The Shop, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Great show, I want to yeah. be on the show. So I see LeBron and I see his friend. His friend is like, you know, having a good time. And he turns and he sees me. And it was like the, a ghost, like, he, he, like the Grim Reaper was at the table. And he, <laughs> he was like, oh my God. And then he's tapping LeBron and then he's whispering LeBron and LeBron's like, what? And then LeBron is, <laughs> does this, right? And he sees me and I can see his face. And I got off and I left. And then I got to my table. I went, I'll walk, me and my security walk all the way back to my table. And I go, you know what? And I'm changing this, being afraid of Jason or narrative yeah. of Jason. I went right back to the table. I said, excuse me. And the guy turned around. He said, look, we're terrified of you. And I said, and we're going to change that because yeah. I'm, I'm an ally. Like, I, I love you. I love the show. <laughs> I'm an ally like, to LeBron. He texts Bron, 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 Bron. And Bron, LeBron turned around. The way you used to go on Tristan. Child. <laughs> but I had forgot the reason. An ally. <laughs> an ally. So I'm like, LeBron, come here. And LeBron came over. I'm like, listen, I'm an ally. We cool. And he gave me the biggest hug. <laughs> he it was, was like a hug. Was it was like a hug right. of relief. Like, oh, all you had to do is rock me. <laughs> no, he was you know? LeBron James rock but, but it, But it, you know, when I think about like the evolution of where I'm going and where this show's going, I don't like that feeling. I don't want yeah. people to be afraid of me. I want people to respect my opinions, respect that I'm fearless and give it to them, giving yeah. them, giving it to them straight. No pun intended. But 
I don't want people to be afraid of me. And I think, like, when I started the show, it was like, pow, pow. It was... <laughs> pew, 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 pew. And the crazy part is you're always trying to balance, like, the audience really loves that, but that's not going to let me grow. Yeah. And so we'll see in the comments, you know, fans will say, oh, well, this show is not what it used to be. We're not all what we used to be. It's, it's called, called evolution, growing. Yeah, it's called yeah. growth. It's so funny. The two things that I've learned from you guys, because I was just thinking about this, from Damage, I've learned to pick my battles. I was like, oh, sometimes I can just like hush and stare. Like I don't I always have to give a hot take on everything, right? So I learned to pull back a little and like to figure out when it makes sense to speak and when not. From you, it's so funny. I was in a room the other day and a bunch of really important people were in the room. So, uh, the commissioner was there and he was like, Jason Lee wrote a check for $25,000 for this organization. Like, I, what commissioner? Who said that? They didn't know. <laughs> yeah, you wrote, check, you wrote a big old check money? for an event. Did you reach for your wallet? No, it was 30000 <laughs> Oh, it's 30000 Yeah, and they were like, yeah, Jason Lee wrote a big old check. And then somebody, I'm not going to say who, was like, what exactly makes Jason Lee special? And I Somebody said that about me? I, I uh -oh. squared up. I, I'm not going to be like, because you, know, you know I'm loyal. <laughs> <laughs> the one thing about tourists is we're very loyal. There have been times you'd be like, blue, stand down, right? So I squared up, and then the damage inside said, blue, this is not the time to be swinging in front of the commissioner or whatnot. And I said, well, I will tell you this, guys. If all of us walked into a room and got five phone numbers, by the end of the week, Jason Lee would be the only person who would have used all five of them to get a business deal from everybody in that leverage. Part. So I need you to know, never in my life have I seen anybody like, if you let him in the room, my G, he's doing something with it. And I used to not be like that. Because of you, I now walk into rooms like, no, I'm the sh I need to leverage this opportunity. And that's a lesson that a lot of people can learn from that they don't give you credit for. We're conditioned to believe that we're less than. Yeah. I don't feel like there's anybody who's you know, bigger than me or, you know, uh, or bigger than you, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And and the thing about it, and, I, and I, I was thinking about this on the way over because everybody that watches the show knows I'm a, I'm a professional name dropper, so I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm about to do it right now. Um, I called Rihanna yesterday, you know, because oh. she had her baby. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to get into the conversation, but I'm talking to her and then, and then Madonna calls and she's like, come to dinner. I'm like, okay. Damn. But you know what I realized that in those moments? They're us. Like, we're all the yeah, same. People. Yeah. Nobody's better than, no, nobody has to be more special than. When you have more, you should do more. Yeah. Because I do have more now, that 30000 I gave was to five kids who, while I was sitting there waiting for mm -hmm. my award, were coming up there and excited <laughs> about receiving a $1,000 scholarship. And I'm thinking, what is a, one, not, no shade, but like, what is $1,000 going to do? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Let me give them a little Books. bit more. Books. Yeah, yeah. so I gave Books them 5000 okay. each. And, I, and, it, and it felt really good to do it. And, and it made an impact because it came up but, in the conversation. Yeah. But look at the hate, though. And this is the thing that's oh, crazy, right? Oh, let's not right? talk about the hate. It was no. one person in the corner. No, but the no, I, I only say that because a lot of us don't do because we're afraid of judgment or people yeah. saying, oh, well, what are the intentions? The intentions are what they are. And people may have different intentions. But, you know, I always, I always find it interesting that no matter how positive you are, no matter what your intentions are, somebody's going to always have something to say. But you can't let that distract you. When you're good to folks... The folks who know you in the room will always have your back even when you're not there. You know yeah. what I mean? And that's the beauty of being good to folks is you never know who's speaking highly of you in rooms that you're not in. Yeah. And that's the beauty of how you do business. Like, we have your back. And somebody saw, Damage even told you, people were like, Jason Lee. And he was like, y yes, Jason Lee, and you good? And I think people are shocked because Boy, oh boy. They, see, they see Damage <laughs> as like this solid straight guy and me as this straight shooting like smart girl. And seeing people like us defend you, they're like, Maybe we did have him wrong, and I love that people are seeing your heart more. Oh, no, no. When I got a little too tipsy in Miami, I knew that's when I knew Damage had my back because he cleared the whole room. The next day, they were like, this guy is crazy. <laughs> he was making sure you were good. He, he told all of them, I don't know none of you and don't care about who any of you are. Yeah, he kept telling me they was with people. That <laughs> the Damage is salty. I'm, I'm, I'm like, He's the spicy one. Jim, no. I think, they think he, me yeah, and you are yeah. spicy. People damage is spicier know. than both of us. The damage will pop off. When that pop off happens, Child. you just gotta go. Okay. Yeah, y'all can get fooled by the show if you want but me and jason are a no, lot I'm more cool. docile than dj damage i'm cool i, I would say Until one it's thing time not to be cool i learned about the situation in general and i think this was i think this is impactful for anybody you have to bet on yourself yeah. and i think working at so many different companies and jumping from companies to companies and then actually working with somebody that built their own platform mm -hmm. it really teach you like yo if you want to do anything in life you have to bet on yourself and you have to go all in. And that's what you did with Hollywood Unlocked. I wasn't there from the very beginning, but I was there some time ago. Mm -hmm. And just to watch how it kept growing, how it kept growing, and the commitment. And that's the stuff people don't see also. They see, 
um, you talk about topics and things on social media, talk about things on a podcast, but they're not ever seeing the business acumen exactly. and the de dedication to your dream. Mm. And if anybody, I don't care who you are, can be inspired by that. I'm inspired by that. To mm. see you take a platform, and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger, and it's becoming an agency. It's become a studio. It's like, if you're not motivated by that, you're really a true hater mm. because this is all one person's dream and it's helping other people with their dreams help me with my dream i'm sure it helped you with your dream and i think it's the most beautiful thing to see as a black man it's like dog you can really do it mm -hmm. this man is here in la we're out here what i don't know we're in the penthouse floor child we're it's a nice studio, we're like, in the biggest penthouse yeah, it's, 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 saying, it's a like, nice studio you yo. gotta bet on yourself so if you really have a dream and you for real about it like i'm not gonna believe you because i've seen somebody go a hundred and forty-five percent into what they wanted to do. So, yeah. well, I will. I will say, um, and the crazy part is, I don't even remember all the moments of it growing. Mm. You know what I mean? Because I've been so in it. The show, the deadlines, the this, the that. And I'm not gonna complain because because of that dedication, that hard work, and that that drive. I was able to build what I was able to build in less than ten years. You know what I mean? So like, we're only into our seventh year and still That's growing. Amazing. But, and, and I really feel in many ways that we're still just getting started. Like there's the other things evolving extensions, opportunities that I'm taking advantage of. And I really love that now other storytellers, they're starting to tell the story. You know, I posted on Facebook and Instagram uh, from foster care to Forbes. And I almost got really emotional because I was, because I was thinking, um, you know, recently Tiffany and I went, Tiffany Haddish and I went back to my hometown where this young girl got stabbed mm -hmm. and killed, right, at my high school. I was really moved to just go there and be with the city and be with these kids. And we were able to get all 1,400 kids out and I bought everybody pizza. And I, because I remember how we loved a pizza day. We loved the chocolate milk day, yes. you know, and, and just little things that we can do to get back to school. We brought the family of the young girl out. Tiffany mm -hmm. was able to talk to the kids and stuff. And then we went to my old group home. Children's Home in Stockton, and we stood in the doorway of the room that I was in when I was there. That would have been emotional. It's an emotional thing about it right now because standing there, the door is much smaller than it was when I was 10 years mm -hmm. old. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the place has expanded. The people were excited to see me there. I was, a, I was a success story. I was the one that made it. And when I think about all the opportunities that I don't get in Hollywood sometimes, and this is the part that I think will make me emotional because it's not because I'm not talented. Mm -hmm. It's because I'm black. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, bothers me. It bothers me that, and that I think, when people are like, oh, he's, he's on his pro-black Now when I realize that you, when you're black, you have an, especially when you're a black owner you, and you have a platform, you have an obligation to be louder because there's so many people working in concert to silence you. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and even the pop out with Wendy during the Met Gala. That was that intentional. Was that was an intentional flex because the show said, you're not big enough to host. Even with Tiffany Haddish on Monday, Cardi B on Tuesday, Mariah Carey on Wednesday, so and so and so and so, you're not big enough. And what I, when I heard that, I was like, you know what, I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna build a show better than yours. I'm gonna make sure I get bigger guests than yours. I'm gonna make sure that I reach audiences that you can't reach. I'm not gonna just do a show for white women in middle America, although I do want you to watch too. <laughs> Please watch, Karen. You know, I'm, I'm building a show that everybody can enjoy and just for an hour a, a week, just escape and have a good time and talk to, and hear from people that other people can't get right now. Um, and I wanna say one more thing, another big flex and another name drop. Last night I was sitting at home on my couch and I'm planning the Hollywood Unlock Impact, uh, Impact Awards. And I pick up the phone and I said, I don't know why I'm going to do this right now because the girl just had a baby. I'm going to call Rihanna and ask her if I can honor her at my award show. Aww. And I called her and she answered. Uh, and, uh, we, you know, chit chat a little bit. And I said, OK, I'm going to ask you a question and I won't be mad if you say no. You can say don't you ain't got to say no to my face. Just give me the contact so I can call with him. And I told her about the award and she said, well, tell me, like, what is, what is it for? What are you doing it for? Like, why? And I said, I want to honor you. Um, well, she said, well, what, what award do you want to give me? I said, the Icon Award. And she was like, oh, really? I said, yeah. And she said, I'll show up for you. Wow. And I'm going to just say this. That there validated my belief that I was big enough for the Wendy Show. I was bigger than the Wendy Show. Mm -hmm. It's not about whether or not I'm big to somebody else or relevant to somebody else I'm okay with what I'm doing and as long as I keep doing what I'm doing and those of you watching keep doing what you're doing and you all do what you do if you keep going and you keep working hard enough the validation comes in the rewards you create for yourself not what somebody else hands you 
all the denials I've been getting, all the rejections and this and that. And, and I don't even audition because I don't like rejection. I did one audition, got rejected. I never did another audition. I hate auditions too. I can't. Because <laughs> I, I want to be like, bitch, I didn't want to do I didn't want this anyway. <laughs> yeah. um, if I can't get it, I'll build it myself. So yeah. if, if you don't want to give me what's already available, I'll go build it myself. And, and to build the award show in the whole conversation of, you know, black people not being awarded or getting the right awards or recognition, as a black man on an award show, that's kind of lit. And I feel like the, the you're not big enough thing really drove me into, for a quick moment, that burnout that I was going through. Because it's like, yo, what else I gotta do? It's demoralized. The, the thing that you're, you're talking about is inclusion, right? And I've been having conversations with my friends about this all week. It's one thing to say you support somebody, it's something, something else to include someone. And when people include you and they call you in, that's when you feel like they really love you and support you. And the fact that you are in this space where you've included us and other people, you've had so many people that people don't even know about, right? And now people who are even higher up and bigger stature are like, oh, we want to include him too. We want to be a part of, we want him to be in the room. And you have a, an ability to get in the room, crack a joke, be very disarming with your charm. I, I think you know what you're doing. And halfway through a key key, someone gets booked. And I'm like, oh, snap, how did you just book God? And so that's one of the things that I've learned from you is when you're inclusive, People want to be there for you. And that's a really, really great skill that you can't really, really teach. And I always say that, you know, I talk about astrology. Leo's are ruled by the heart. Mm. And I think a lot of people don't realize how much your heart rules the work that you do. It's mm. not the mess. You know, the mess is what gets the clicks. It's actually your heart. That's what gets their attention to. But, I, but, you know, thank you for that. And I, I'll go back to Rihanna, what she said at the end of it. And this is why I just love her so much. She said, I really love how your brand is evolving and I want to mm. help you. Like that, that to me is, is, is special. And it just, it really makes all the other people who've hated, who've blocked, who've had something negative to say, who's been circumspect, who's been judgmental or doubtful or whatever, not even matter. I also want to shout out Lonnie Love. I did see Lonnie Love recently at Kevin Hart's um, Netflix uh, brunch. And we had a conversation. I've been very judgmental of Lonnie Love. I've talked shit about her. <laughs> and, I, and I said to her, when she gave me her number, I'm like, girl, you do know I be talking shit about you, right? She's like, I know and I don't care. Okay, cool. Um, she said, I don't take it personal, but we were talking about the ending of The Real, which the last episode airs June 3rd. Oh, wow. And she was telling me about how, you know, uh, you know the show's over, whatever, and, and we talked about it. And the one thing that came through from the conversation was all the stuff that they've been going through behind the scenes. You know, Amanda Seals was also at this brunch. You remember mm -hmm. they hired her? I was like, she's too black for that show. What, she, what, what I got from her was how she didn't have full control because she didn't own it and how mm. much she respected me because of she said at the award show when you got up there and you talked about freedom and the ability to do whatever you want and say whatever you want and book whoever you want and deny whoever you don't want and just be in full control she was like that level of freedom we don't have in time yeah. mm -hmm. and and when she said it it goes back to here i think i'm not as powerful because i'm not on tv mm -hmm. when the people on tv think that i'm more powerful because you are yeah ownership is everything there's symbols and then there's ownership and a lot of people are, are being leveraged as symbols and getting paid to be symbols being an owner is a whole different playing yeah. field so. and it's not easy no and 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 i'll say something too to all of you black people who look like me in spaces where we all don't exist and where you may be the only one at the table and some of you I've had direct conversations with, I'm not gonna say your names, I know you're waiting with bated breath for me to say your name and you're afraid sitting up there in your little dockers. Um, you know, <laughs> you have an obligation to put, you have an obligation to help. And you know, you have to be afraid of how big my voice is getting because the bigger and bigger it gets. Once I got that real megaphone, I'm going to do a report card because there's so many of them that have access to budgets you know like if you have an idea if you have an event series or you have an HBCU tour idea or you have a humanized show that you want to bring to life or a podcast that you know is going to like strike the hearts of our people and re reach people in a way that haven't been reached before if there's people in positions to put that show on put it on if yeah. there's if there's people in positions with brands to invest because that's really what it is everybody out here want to buy in black and invest in black well if you do put your money where your mouth is like giving it to the United Negro College Fund, NAAC is cute because that's all you know where to go. But there's other people out there like us, young black entrepreneurs who are investing in culture. And it, it's interesting because every single article I've done, just did Forbes, did um, Nylon, did, um, I can't remember everything. I did just, complex just did Complex. Yeah. Uh, everything is focused on culture. You're driving culture, culture. You're the post the culture, the White House calling. You're the culture, you're the culture. Well, if y'all see it, start investing in it because mm -hmm. 
I think them not wanting to invest is a way of hoping that it just runs dry. Like mm -hmm. if we just, if we just, if we just, uh, if we don't send any money over there, it's going to go away at some point. But guess what? There's a lot of young black businesses that believe in Hollywood Unlocked and believe in me and continue to feed the company. And, uh, and you know, you guys didn't come here because there was nobody else. You came here because your gift, you know, we've been talking a lot about me and Hollywood Unlocked, but let's talk about you. You know, the selflessness, the flexibility, the ability to have open minds and conversation. You know, uh, sometimes I come in very moody. Uh, I got my own personal <laughs> going on I think just the patience for understanding that there's a lot going on in my life where yeah. you know I had to tell myself consciously one day don't go crazy like all these other people do because it will really drive you it'll really drive you crazy but I just appreciate just you know we, we built friendships and we didn't just show up and do a job this is this is a, a great moment this chapter is over but there will be many more chapters hopefully in this book you know uh, Hollywood and Locke has become a universe so hopefully you will see us more in that universe, right? Like the Marvel universe? <laughs> yeah, the Hollywood Unlocked oh, listen, universe. You know what's crazy is I already have another idea, but I'm waiting. I'm waiting on things to come to fruition. You know, I, I got to be very careful before I speak to them, so I had this other idea. But no, nah, I mean, of course, we're the, the hardest part about ending the show has not been whether or not the show is good or not. It's whether it's, it's this, you know, like breaking yeah. this up. But, um, but just because this show is ending doesn't mean that we're not friends and we're not figuring something out. We're going to figure it out. Again, endings get to be beginnings if you have the right mindset. And this feels to me more like a beginning than an ending. And I think the timing is impeccable, too, because we're all at a space of transition. And so everybody gets to breathe and, like, recalibrate and then come back with fresh ideas and fresh energy. So I love it. I think, I think this is divine timing. Yeah. I love everything about how this is playing out. Okay, so Humanize. I saw you're on episode five now. What are you? No, we're on episode 27. 27. I know. Wait, did, was the episode he was just on, was that 25? That was, was that 26, five? yeah. Okay, 26. And, and the, the, the crazy thing is it used to be like once in a while somebody would have a great conversation. We've now pivoted to weekly because mm. there's a lot of conversations to be had. And I, I just love talking to people about who they are as people and their hearts. I think Johnny mentioned, he was like, you know, you talk about deep stuff, but it's so conversational. Like, that's the point. Like, deep conversations don't have to be boring and heavy. And I think we're used to either having fun or being healthy. And, and what I'm trying to do is make it popular and sexy to be healthy and have fun at the same mm -hmm. time. And the funny thing is, your episode is what made me realize that this was something that had legs. Because you were really like one of my guinea pigs. Mm -hmm. You were episode six or well, seven. No shade of damage. It was the best show you've ever had. <laughs> I mean, I, mean I, I actually watched the show a couple of times because I was, um, you know, I did go in. I remember not wanting to, I didn't want to talk about a lot. Some stuff. I do remember now because, you know, I felt like there were these things that were always chasing me the old Jason, the, the, the Jason. But what I loved about the conversation was it really allowed a person to break down moments that, you know, people may have seen or thought or whatever. And, and talk through it, and, and it made it easier to go to other shows too. But I will say, you know, now when I do other people's shows, I come in prepared. A couple things: one, be really honest, but also have that pow pow ready if they really try me, <laughs> you know. Uh, but nobody's really tried me yet, um, and I know it's coming at some point because people love those moments. And that's what I love about your show and even this show too, uh, is that um, we don't have the gotcha moments. We ain't yeah. trying to get you, mm -hmm. you know. You know, disarming people, creating a space for them to speak and breathe. And, 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 and just be comfortable, literally will give you everything you're asking for. Yeah. You know? Um, well, when you human, like the reason why we call the show Humanize is because I realized that when you humanize everybody in the room, a good conversation is guaranteed. Because we're all just human beings doing human shit. And Damage's episode, it was so popular because I think people were really interested hearing a black man and a black woman talk about things and not necessarily always agree, but figure out a common ground without attacking each other. It's so sad that not attacking each other, but having real conversation, is a weird thing in this current climate. Yeah. And I think even with Hollywood Unlocked, we started getting to that place where, with the exception of that one crazy person who um, we'll never speak of again, Voldemort, we, for the most part, <laughs> you, you, know, you know who Voldemort is. We, for the most part, were able to have some really provocative conversations and at the end of the show still be laughing. Yeah. Whether we, we agreed or not. Yeah, because, <laughs> you know, when you're, like, we don't plan this show out. We yeah. don't plot out, okay, you're going to say this, you're going to say that, and... You know, again, I think of a, <clears throat> I damage his facial expression. We should do a recap show of just damage his reaction. Cause yeah. Some of the shit I'd be saying, he'd be like, what? <laughs> like, where, where, where did that even come from? 
Um, but no, you know, and, and then another thing I learned from you, those courses, you know, I didn't know he was making all this money with these courses, but more, but beyond just making the money, being able to like, again, to whom much is given, much is required, being able to give game to people, you know, and yeah, it's definitely much bigger than the money. It's a very oh, yeah, big to commitment to the people because yeah. it's, it's a, it's a grind. Mm-hmm. It's a grind. The money was like third on the list of the obligations, you know, that come like, thank God, but honestly to especially somebody in your position to have so much information to give and to give it to people that are really dedicated to wanting to do it. It's like when you see those students grow and do something like you just feel so good. And there's so many people that have been in my courses that have reached out to me like I wouldn't have got this opportunity if it wasn't for your course or I would have never moved to L.A. if it wasn't for your course. So it's that's what it's all about, man. The Shout out to the courses. One of his are mentees. The still available? Yeah. Yeah, it's still available. What's the courses? Yeah, legendarymediacourse.com or legendarymediagroup.com. Make sure you check it out. Yeah. One of his mentees moved to LA and became my assistant for a year. Really? So that's, that's how much the course is. And now he's doing his own podcast. So he, he, like, that's what I'm telling you. Like, we get to feed each other in so many ways that I, I don't think people really realize when they watch the show. Yeah. Well, the, I mean, again, now I'm in the heart of my courses and we're, we're, we're done. We, we started filming them now and we built the funnel and all, that process is exciting. And I, I do feel the amount of work coming with it mm-hmm. because it's it's like it's not just a, you drop your courses like it's a movement that's getting ready mm-hmm. to happen you know and I'm getting excited about that but you know I've run into your mentees all the time too I remember when you came to DJ Damage's course I'm like yeah I remember um, <laughs> but that's great though to see that somebody took the course becomes an assistant you know gets out here starts their own podcast because that's what you create the course for exactly. and, and then years later they'll be somewhere like me. Thanking the way I, I thank Dana, you know, relentlessly for you know oh, the inspiration I love she gave me. That. Yeah. I'm still gonna recruit you guys. You guys, since we're talking about this, yeah. for the emotional intelligence stuff. I okay. know you keep on acting like you're not emotionally intelligent. I keep telling you. But what you does do that even mean? Like emotional intelligence means the ability to see yourself clearly in the room and to be able to leverage opportunities to get where you're going. So it doesn't mean that you have to be the most moralistic person. It just means you're self-aware enough to know how you show up in the room. Okay, well, I'm emotionally intelligent enough to know that this show is over. And <laughs> I'm also humanized enough to say that I appreciate all of you for showing up for us for the last six years. Thank I mean, you. six years is a long, dedicated time. I was online the other day and this woman came in, April, I think your name was, on Clubhouse. And you ran down to me the very, very first episode and then wow. gave me episodes every year that you've watched. You've watched every single episode. And so it's not an easy decision, you know, because of people like you. But I just want to say to everybody, thank you so much. And stay tuned to everything that the three of us are doing. And you're going to see us together again at some point. Yes. But, but, um, but we got the emotional intelligence to say you're not going to see us no more right now. Peace. <laughs> Although we're sad to see the end of Hollywood Unlocked with Jason Lee Uncensored, you know we couldn't let you go without recapping the hottest moments from the show. Six years ago, we debuted our first show. And since then... We've had interviews with some of the biggest names in Hollywood. We've also discussed serious matters like politics, domestic violence, and sexual abuse. And we've had some fun and interesting moments with our guests, like interview with professional head Dr. Prisha. Let's take a quick trip down memory lane and look at a few clips of our biggest celebrity sit-downs. Like the how you doings come from, you know, after 11 years being on TV, the 11th season starts, you know, September 16th. But yeah, the how you doings, honestly, come from it, everywhere. It used to be no, it used to be Melissa, a stereotype, mm-hmm. a black woman. Mm-hmm. Now it's everybody. Yeah, and white people love you. Uh, Indian Everybody people, loves you. green people, Everybody Asian loves people. I get that. How you doings, men, women, straight, gay, trans, whatever, everything. When I first met you, we were we all went to Miami on vacation. I will never forget. You know, some of my friends, you know, they may have two, three condoms in case you know they got to hit something off on the way home. But you had the biggest Ziploc bag full of condoms. Safe sex. Yeah, they were. We should safe, yes. And so they were all gold. So I'm just wondering, like, for the people who, now I'm not talking about golden showers. Shout out to R. Kelly. But you know, how, do, how do the women watching who want to be a part of the Gold Star family, how do they? What are you attracted to? And then I'm just, I'm attracted to just winning in life. But yeah. far as what Jason talking about with women, okay, he, on, he, he, okay. he going he going over my head. But you, so, you, how about this? But how about should, a, a young man like me? If I wanted to start a the gold medal family, what are some things? Yeah, give him some tips. What are some things I should look out? How should I maneuver in that space? Well, one thing you can say to a female that I saw him say is, if you just give me one percent of your trust, I'll earn the other ninety nine percent. 
that but, was crazy. Oh my god, you got oh, oh, so yeah. give me the game. Give you me got game. game now, yeah, Ford, well, give me the game. He, he, I'm just saying. I mean, you can say stuff like his I, eyes soften whenever he looks at me. Like he has game. You can say mm. that. You can say stuff like I ain't trying to be your man. I'm trying to be your sponsor. I mean, it's just different things. <laughs> well, now, now, like, but then, but then, you all came to Puffy's house, and when you got there, I said to her earlier on the show when we opened that. You you were different than you are right now. You're turned on. You're Cardi B right now. But when you got there, you were really low key. I said, "Hey, Queen Cardi," you're like, "Nah, nah, nah, nah I'm not the queen." You. The thing I love about you is you just come off very humble, and I like that. Oh well, thank you very much. Some things I'm a little cocky on. You know what I'm saying? So what what are you cocky about? The music? Sucking. <laughs> What makes you the? Because we've had an, we've actually had an oral doctor here on the show teaching people how to suck. And she blew a cucumber. She did. Went yes. viral. I'll was tanning. I yeah. want to be that cucumber mm. so bad. I don't know. I don't know what it is. Just tell me. Tell me all the time. And it's like, damn. I want. I don't know where it is. But I ain't gonna. I ain't gonna tell y'all because I ain't gonna tell y'all my secrets. But right. what I want to tell people. My secrets. It might and they're going to be good like me. <laughs> it might have. Wait, so what, what, were you ever intimidated, though? Because You know what? I'm not going to lie. I always knew I was nice, son. Really? Nice. Really? I, I love did. that. I, I, knew, I, knew, I knew I had something special. And I knew with Biggie, like, being my coach, I knew that I was going to be great. Mm -hmm. When I knew I was real you good. You listen? I'm, I listened to, he used to call me a lieutenant. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you look on like some of the albums and if you listen, he used to, says lieutenant in some of the songs and stuff. He's talking about me. Mm -hmm. And he always called me a lieutenant because he said he could tell me something and I would put it into motion perfectly. Mm -hmm. He already knew that I had what it took to be. You know, when Biggie passed, it could have been any one of us who had to be the one, mm -hmm. you know? But what, but that that era, I remember watching that on television um, and seeing you and Mary and Dana and just people like it was, you know, because you know you look at you and everybody watching is looking at you as just the icon, the mm -hmm. the figure. Like you're not a real she, person. I don't know how to explain <laughs> no. that. She yeah. got Diana Ross to pat her titty. I on know. Television. <laughs> okay. I Man, those were some big moments in HU's history, and people are still talking about them to this day. Now, outside of the TV and spill, we also address some more serious matters. As you know, Hollywood Unlocked founder Jason Lee created the platform to help celebrities share their truths and regain control of their narratives tarnished by the media. We've also shared political knowledge, and we welcome politicians like Reverend Al Sharpton, Congresswoman Maxine Waters, and Karen Bass. And recently, Black Lives Matter co-founder Patrice Cullors we took a stance against domestic violence and sexual abuse, and we sat down with survivors. Let's take a look at a few moments when we shared our platform to give survivors a voice. I have no reason to lie on anybody, because this is about my truth. But I'm asking, why the are you teaching a five or six year old how to jack off? Mm. Now that I'm older, now I'm a 35 year old man, I'm saying, okay, they were probably priming me, okay? Okay, now they're coming back over to pick me up a little bit more often, and before I know it, you know, my brother, my brother's doing to me before I know it. I'm at the house. So I think there, I think my stepfather kind of was curious about what was really, you know, what MO was, you know, to each his own. I mean, I'm not here to, nor do I want my legacy to be about uh, my cousin. You know, there's all kind of people in the family. People do all kind of so you left while you were pregnant? Yeah. I filed for divorce in April um, and Knight was born in July. Wow. So what was an intense low? Like, what was the lowest point in your marriage? Um, <laughs> we had a lot. I mean, honestly, like, if I were to really tell the stories, I, I couldn't write. The, like, it was that crazy. Like, it was dark. It was really dark. Like, you know, there was a lot of drinking. There was a lot of just mental and physical abuse. And it just got to the point where... I think for me, you know, God is so good because being pregnant, that's, I think that, I, I probably would have stayed longer had I not been pregnant. Mm -hmm. Because I really did love him and because we were married, we weren't dating, we were married. Like, this was my person. Okay. He didn't get there to maybe like 30 or 45 minutes afterwards. She must so have the fight was completely over? Yeah. And everything was calm? Yeah. So then he pulls up and then what happens? He stumps up the steps. Um, where that bitch at? Where that bitch at? Hmm? Bitch, I'll kill you. I'm talking with a gun. Bitch, I'll kill you. And he take, he takes the gun, puts the gun in my head. Bitch, I'll kill you. Bitch, I'll kill Wait, you. Wait, the gun touched your head? Yeah. I don't know if you've ever been in those kind of scenarios, you know, but no, like... not like that. But like, at the, you know, like a person just kind of talking themselves into kind of doing it. 
Like, bro, for real? Like, I'm like, if you was gonna do that, you should've used it. Man, those were some tough stories to hear, but also empowering moments that need to be had, and we're happy we were able to help share these truths. Now, HU also provided safe sex knowledge for its audience, especially when we had professional head doctor pre-show on the show. Things went from zero to 100 real quick. Yo, get a hold of yourself. I'm Let good, me I'm say. Good. But I can go again. No, it's Wait. Not oh, no, you're fine. Let you me just say that. We gonna turn the music room. back up now. Turn the music back up. <laughs> Let me just say, <laughs> she is the head doctor. Yes, because <laughs> I ain't seen it. That, I mean, this is what I this is what I learned from it. Because I was eating my cucumber. Because I ain't doing I ain't doing all that. What did you learn, Jason? I learned that thou shalt not give up. It's you have to be resil resilient. And you see, my eyes are watery. You were not playing. <laughs> Man, we had some wild times on Hollywood Unlocked with Jason Lee Uncensored. We thank you all for joining us on this wild ride, and we hope you stick around to see what's next to come. You know Jason Lee's always up to something, so be sure you don't miss out on any updates, and make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on all social media. This is DJ Damage signing off. Peace.